Hi, everyone. We are very pleased to welcome you to our webinar today titled Delivering Virtual Care to Manage Chronic Respiratory Disease, Tips for Healthcare Providers. So today we have Dr. Nauman Naeem um, and Valerie Filto. By the end of this presentation, um, participants will be able to discuss the benefits and challenges to using virtual technology to deliver, deliver chronic respiratory disease care, describe the clinical tools and resources that can assist in the delivery of virtual chronic respiratory disease management programs, discuss the barriers for patients and providers and mitigation strategies to use uh, to the use of virtual te te care technology for delivering pulmonary rehabilitation, and apply practical tips for integrating virtual care into your existing chronic respiratory disease management, management program. So we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Naoman Naeem. He is a respirologist and intensivist who did his internal medicine training at Case Western University's Metro Health Medical Center. He then went on to complete his pulmonary and critical care fellowship at Case Western's University Hospitals of Cleveland. He practiced in Northwest Ohio for six years before moving back to the GTA in 2011, where he grew up. He practices respirology at Humber River Hospital and critical care at Guelph General Hospital. He also has an office respirology practice in addition to his virtual respirology practice. In addition, he has interest in writing, speaking, teaching, mentoring, nutritional medicine, and holistic healthcare, and has published a book entitled Healing from the Inside Out overcome chronic disease and radically change your life. Our next speaker is Valerie Filto. She is currently working as a physiotherapist with the Lanark Renfrew Lung Health Program offering chronic disease rehabilitation in the community. She graduated from the University of Ottawa with Bachelor of Science in Physiotherapy and has 15 years of experience working in cardiac and pulmonary rehabilitation. She has worked in cardiac and pulmonary rehabilitation at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute Montfort Hospital, and North Lanark Community Health Center. She recently became a certified respiratory educator. So without further ado, I will, um, I will hand it over to Dr. Nauman Naeem. Okay, thank you, Sarah, for um, that introduction. So we're gonna talk about um, caring for asthma and COPD patients virtually, but you know, I wanna just say that um, in my virtual practice, I have looked after every single diagnosis that I actually see in the office, including idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, people with neuromuscular issues, um, sleep apnea. So this is not just limited to asthma and COPD, okay? So I have no disclosures and I have no other interests or conflicts of interest with this presentation. And um, yeah, so no uh, commercial support. So a bit about me, I'm, I'm a practicing respirologist and intensivist for uh, 15 years. And I've been uh, practicing in the US and Canada, as Sarah mentioned, and I returned to uh, Canada back in 2011. I've been involved in virtual care for 11 years. And it was initially in uh, something called an electronic ICU. And, and where I worked in Northwest Ohio, I was doing that for two years where we would be monitoring close to 100 patients who are in intensive care units. And the reason we did that is because the ICU model in the US is an open ICU model. They don't have a closed ICU model where you have an intensivist looking after the entire unit. Intensivists are consulted. So they needed some sort of coverage at night. So that's where I started my um, virtual care journey. And it continued with respirology uh, here when I came back to Canada. Um, so, you know, the, the questions that I'm gonna try and answer are, Acknowledging the need for virtual care, exploring the benefits of virtual care to treat asthma and COPD, overcoming challenges and barriers, and how the delivery of virtual care can be optimized um, for timely access to care. Um, so I'm gonna address these questions and hopefully more than that. So um, the problem, and I'm gonna add to this, okay? This was uh, a presentation which I'm gonna, I, I, I actually did for rural care, but it's not modified for the current times. There's long wait times for access to specialists, long distance of travel to see specialists, over-reliance on inpatient hospital resources. And now we can say that there is a risk involved with the current COVID-19 pandemic to seeing uh, respiratory patients in person. Now that risk will change over time. Uh, you know, we are seeing less and less cases of COVID-19. I work in ICU, so I, I know that. 
but we don't know if there's going to be a second wave. We, we don't know how this is projected to go be ongoing in some shape, way, shape or form for the next couple of years. So this is not a problem that's going to be going away. It'll just change, um, change the degree of severity over time. So the solution is virtual care, which uses telecommunications technology to provide clinical care and improves medical uh, access to medical services that wouldn't be available. And I just want to, to broaden this a little bit. You know, when I talk about virtual care, what I'm talking about is the current software that's available, including the Ontario Telemedicine Network. And there's other platforms that are available online. But a lot of my respirology colleagues are doing this by phone, right? I mean, you know, a lot of the patients may not have um, the technology that they need to access the, uh, the software. The thing is though, however, everybody has a smartphone these days, right? So the patients can do this with a smartphone. They don't need a laptop, they don't need a desktop. So when I talk about virtual care, just keep in mind that I'm also talking about delivering this care by phone. So I want to talk about how we do it uh, in, in, in our, uh, in our uh, system. So I work in, um, I provide uh, care to rural Wellington County, uh, as well as up in the Hearst and Timmins area. And the, the team compo is composed of a respirologist, a certified respiratory educator, a kinesiologist, dietitian uh, for outreach, uh, an outreach worker and a social worker. So this is the team. And the types of issues that we can care for, I already mentioned this, that it's not just limited to asthma and COPD. I mean, I have looked after patients with pulmonary fibrosis, uh, pulmonary hypertension, um, sleep apnea, um, uh, other interstitial lung disease, uh, and neuromuscular disease. And, um, you know, I don't limit my practice to adults. So I, I do some pediatrics, but I only do up to eight, uh, as, as young as age 12. And the reason I do that is because the communities that I serve virtually, um, they don't have access to a pediatric respirologist. Um, and the referral to the virtual health program occurs through primary care providers in the area. So, you know, my services are advertised to the primary care providers in the family health team of the different areas I serve. However, also one of the things my uh, CRE, or her name is Tracy Livingston and she's, uh, she's wonderful. She has access, so there's a local hospital, um, Palmerston Hospital, she has access to all the patients that come to that hospital uh, that are admitted, that come to the for emergency visit for various reasons. So she can look them up and see who's been admitted for respiratory symptoms, whether it's shortness of breath, cough, wheezing. Um, and, you know, she can screen those patients. And then she, what she does is that she can go and contact the primary care provider and say, listen, your patient was in the ER over the weekend or last week. And I've noticed that they're a smoker or, you know, they have these other risk factors, you know, maybe you should consider getting a spirometry. So usually the, the primary care providers are so busy that they will give her permission to go ahead and order a spirometry and refer the patient to me. Now, I'm not the only respirologist who serves this area. There are a bunch of other respirologists. I would say that I see the bulk of the patients because the other respirologists don't give as many virtual care days. But it's, this is not really a monopoly of mine. It's, there's a bunch of respirologists that are providing this care. I just happen to be the one who sees the most because I give them more days. The other ones only give half a day a month, and I give up to three, three, three or four days, sometimes four, but usually two to three days a month, full days. Um, so the virtual health program components are one-on-one -on -one respirology clinics, case conferencing, pulmonary rehab, and self-management. Now, the one-on-one -on -one respirology clinic is basically me interacting with the patient, with the certified respiratory educator, with the patient. Um, now, case conferencing means that I have already seen the patient. There may be a minor issue that needs to be dealt with, whether it's a medication change or just a quick follow-up. I do that with the CRE. The patient doesn't necessarily need to be involved, but the patient does get involved for follow-up if their symptoms have not improved or if they've gotten worse. So we have that option. 
So what happens is that, um, you know, the, the CRE is the one who identifies the patients from the family doctor who refers them either there or through the emergency department screening. Uh, and basically, the, the, she will collect and forward the information to me. Um, when the patient arrives, so the patient has to go to a telehealth center, but actually because of the pandemic, I've been doing home visits. So we've eliminated, we've even eliminated that aspect of them having to go somewhere to be in front of a, uh, like a video screen to be, to interact with me. We've eliminated that. And I've been doing home visits, uh, either uh, through laptop, smartphone, or phone. But the advantage of the patient coming to the uh, to see to the telehealth center is that the the, the CRE can get the vitals and actually do an, a lung exam and our, and our cardiac exam and tell me if there's any leg swelling or that sort of thing. So that's the advantage of doing that. So we're trying to get back to that once we get into phase two and phase three of the pandemic. But right now I'm still doing home visits. We're hoping that next month we'll start doing those in person, not in person, but what I mean is in person through the virtual, uh, the virtual uh, software. Now, in terms of case conferencing, I talked about case conferencing. This means that I have already seen the patient, right? And you know, there may be an issue, for example, uh, there may be a progression in the disease. The medications may not be optimized, what I prescribed. There may be tests that I've ordered like spirometry or pulmonary function tests that need to be followed up on. And basically uh, the CRE will collect that information and forward it on to me. And then there's self-management aspect. There's action plans. There's one on wealth health coaching, which is done by the CRE. And then we had, she, she actually runs a pulmonary rehab program, which you're going to hear about in the second half of this hour. And she also runs a smoking cessation program. Now, what are the benefits of the virtual care? So basically the patient is at the center of this. Basically you have the primary care physician, the specialist, and the healthcare system, which in this case is the virtual care system, usually administered by the Ontario Telemedicine Network. But we're basically putting the patient at the center of this. The patient is the focus of um, the virtual care program. And that is a benefit, that the patient is the, is the focus of this. The benefits of the special, to the specialist are eliminates the need for a physical office space. Technology is minimal, smartphone or tablet. They can be seen by any, from anywhere. Uh, eliminates travel, travel of the physician to get to a physical office and travel of the patient to get to the office. And there's very low overhead. The only overhead is, the, is, is your smartphone or your laptop. And possibly if you're getting some any advanced software, um, there may be a cost of that. The benefit to the system, you reduce an avoidable use of healthcare system, reducing ED, emergency department visits, reducing admissions, and uh, reducing other costs. And in this time and age, you reduce the risk of transmitting COVID-19, not only from the patient to you, or but the patient to other patients, you know, because there's going to be other patients visiting that office, right? And, you know, physicians are having to become creative with their waiting spaces, right? They're, ha they're, they're not allowing patients to wait in their waiting room. So this eliminates all of that. So this is some data of how we've been able to impact one community. And I believe this is all from Palmerston, which is a small town uh, northwest of Guelph. So over um, the course of uh, two different uh, time zones, 2016 to 2017, uh, to 2017, 2018, we've been able to decrease emergency department visits, decrease hospital admissions, and decrease 30-day readmissions. And we've documented this in, in Palmerston. And we've also been able to decrease uh, the number of emergency department visits for specific patients from three times a year. So there was a lot of patients with severe COPD who were visiting the emergency department on a continuous basis, three times per year. We've reduced that. I mean, the numbers are small, but I mean, there is, it is significant for this community. And this is a small hospital. And the number of admissions we've reduced from seven to one. I mean, these were patients that were getting admitted for several times per year. Um, the benefit to the primary care provider, it improves healthcare provider effectiveness and efficiency and provide, increases provider capacity because now you don't have to wait to be seen to, for a patient to, to be, be in a waiting list, to be seen by a, uh, someone in their office. Um, there is easy interaction between not only the patient and myself as a specialist, but 
uh, myself and the primary care provider. I often communicate with the primary care providers either by, um, you know, by a secure email system or directly by phone to talk to them about their patients. So it eliminates those wait times for specialists because you know, often these communities are referring to specialists outside their community to bigger areas and they have longer wait times. And the more and more respirologists that now during the pandemic are doing virtual care, we're even cutting back further on those wait times because now I don't have to wait for an office day, right? I only have certain office days, but I can do virtual care any, especially with home visits, I can do it any day of the week. Now with the telehealth center, center where they come in and are assessed by the CRE, you know, I have to schedule those days like I would schedule my physical office days, right? But now during the last few months, it's just been home care and I can do that any time. If I see something urgent come up, say I've seen a patient, there's an urgent issue, I can schedule them the next day. I just send out an email to them and, then, and I set it up through, my, uh, through my, the software I use. Benefit to the patient, uh, improved access to specialists, enhance uh, quality patient-centered care, improved follow-up, reduce wait times, eliminates unnecessary travel and associated costs, uh, less time off work, decreased financial burden, improved the disease self-management, and less of a risk to contract COVID-19, which I haven't added to this list. So, you know, the costs of not using virtual care, um, in one year, you save 284 million kilometers of travel. And this is data that we've collected. Uh, and $77 million in travel costs. And then you add parking time, a uh, cost of parking, time off work, child care. And then in the winter, there's weather and road conditions. And then you have to factor in frail and elderly patients who may not necessarily be able to travel. And the most important issue right now, which is infection control, preventing the spread of COVID-19. So there are some challenges and barriers. I'm not going to say it's seamless. Sometimes it, it takes longer for me to see a patient really via tele teleconference. And because there's a lot more conversation involved, right? Because I'm not able to examine the patient, so I have to ask a lot more questions. Um, there are some administrative and clinic resource costs to support uh, the workup, but they're very minimal. Um, and sometimes there can be technical difficulty uh, with OTN, I have seen, but with other, uh, uh, other software as well, a lot more people going online, um, you know, but, you know, if you have a good Wi-Fi connection, you have reliable, reliable laptop and software, that last issue is usually has not been an issue for me in the last few months. Um, so there, there are, you know, we need to attract more respirologists to using virtual care, especially a lot more are using it. And the thing I want to emphasize, I really encourage them to use the software that's available to do virtual face-to-face -face visits, uh, you know, online. However, you know, you can even do this easily by a over a phone. And you know, we need improved internet speeds and um, and improved internet access in rural areas. But this is actually, uh, you know, improving as as we speak. And then we know to we need to ensure that the patient is educated before the visit and they are educated by the CRE and even for the home visits, the CRE will call the patient and, and explain to them what's going to happen and what's involved. And, um, and during those home visits. So what happens is this. So say I need to order prescriptions or I need to order tests. I have my smartphone with me and I'm texting the CRE and telling them, listen, I've just seen so and so patient needs, uh, for example, Simbicor 200 two puffs twice a day. Can you call it into this pharmacy? Um, also, they need spirometry, they need an echo, they need whatever. So I'm texting the CRE while I'm seeing them. So, the, the, so she's taking the brunt of that administrative work to, to order whatever the patient needs and, and, it, and it's, it's getting done. So virtual care improves patient outcomes. Using virtual care decreases the burden on the healthcare system. And, uh, and it is a key component of lung health programs. And, and now with what's happening in the last few months with this pandemic, I see virtual care becoming more prominent, not only for patients who don't or live in rural areas, but for patients in also urban areas. And I don't think, it, I think it's here to stay. I don't think it's gonna go away. And the whole reason I got involved in virtual care in the first place, because I saw the future. I saw that this is going to become more prominent as technolo technology advances and improves over time. And I didn't foresee this pandemic, but now uh, that we're in the situation that we're in, I'm glad that I got involved in virtual care 11 years ago. Telemedicine is the future of rural medicine. And uh, I would say not necessarily the future of all medicine, 
but it is here to stay. And this is my CRE, Tracy Livingston, who I work with mainly. I also work with another one up north, uh, Bridget, um, Bridget Bezalets, but the bulk of my patients are seen uh, with Tracy. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. And um, I'm gonna stop my slide share and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, um, from the so I, I see some questions um, in the Q&A tab here, Dr. Sure. Na um, Naeem. So I'll just um, address these questions and um, please, um, if anyone else has questions, please uh, put them yeah. in the Q&A section so that we can address them. So the first question is, um, are there privacy issues with, um, in particular with the smartphone virtual care that you mentioned? Right. So, so the thing is, uh, so the, the privacy issues when I'm using, so I, I do this on my laptop and the, pay, the, the software I use is either OTN. Now what I use is called Doxy, Doxy Me. Okay. And anything that I use has to be HIPAA compliant, has to be secure. So I don't use anything that's not secure. So there are, there are no privacy issues as long as we're using software that has been registered uh, to be secure and it is listed uh, I believe it's listed by the OTN um, uh, which software actually if Tracy you're on you're on this web and uh, if you're on the webinar just send a message through the text chat and let me know where it's listed the secure software that can be used so if you're using secure software um, there is uh, no privacy issues um, with doing using that software Okay, um, so um, the CREs that you work with, um, what generally are their professions um, or their backgrounds? So CRE stands for Certified Respiratory Educator. So they can be of various backgrounds. They could be a, uh, a, a nurse, uh, they could be a respiratory therapist, um, and it depends on the community in the area, right? So usually it's, uh, it's a nurse of some kind or a respiratory therapist. Um, and the CR and the Certified Respiratory Educator Program is a program I, that I believe that that, um, that someone can do through the Ontario Lung Association. Is that correct, Sarah? Yes. Yeah. Through so uh, RestCheck. Yeah. So it's something they can do through the OLA. So if anyone's interested, I encourage you to contact Sarah and the OLA to learn more about that, uh, to get a CRE to your area. Um, but you know, the thing is that I've been doing this directly with the patient. The thing is, the CRE helps me coordinate a lot of the visits and helps me um, order some of the tests and, um, and, and some of the medication. So if you didn't have a CRE, um, if you have existing office staff, you could do it with your office staff, right? Your front desk staff or medical assistant. So they could do a lot of the things that you were doing in person uh, that, you've, that you've ordered virtually, they can coordinate that, so. Okay. Uh, so I'll just um, field a few more questions. Are there remuneration issues for physicians using remote technology for visits? No, there is no remuneration issue at all. In fact, uh, if you use OTN, there's an actual, uh, an extra code you can bill for using uh, telemedicine uh, care. Uh, so it gives you an extra premium. And now that uh, with the pandemic, there is now telephone codes that you can bill uh, if you're doing this by phone. So there, I have had no, I've been doing this for 11 years. Uh, in Canada, I've been doing it for eight years. Um, yeah, probably seven or eight years. And I've had no billing issues at all. Um, another question is, how do you assess asthma or COPD control virtually without mm -hmm. having um, the ability to perform spirometry at this time? Right, so the thing is that uh, a lot of my patients who come to me, they already have spirometry. So Tracy will actually have, if, if they're coming to me with shortness of breath or cough or wheezing, um, or they're a smoker, she will already have them had spirometry in that clinic or at the local hospital. And I already have that before I see the patient. Now, sometimes there's an urgent visit and they haven't had the chance to have spirometry and pulmonary function tests. So in that case, I order it and it gets done in that local community and I get the results uh, sent to me through a virtual uh, secure network and I have access to that. Then I can do either a case conference with Tracy or Bridget to discuss the results um, or I can bring the patient back for a follow-up to discuss the results. And if some people have asked me in the past about what about auscultation? So, so this is the thing, there is a virtual stethoscope that you can purchase and there is software 
where you can actually escort a patient who is hundreds of miles away through this virtual software and the virtual stethoscope. And I believe it's a USB plug-in. Uh, and I have never used it myself because I haven't really needed it. But if you really do feel the importance of escorting the lungs and the heart, there is a way to do that. It's available. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions with regards to spirometry at home. So do you have any experience or patients doing spirometry in their own homes, um, such as Bluetooth spirometry or, right. or any other technology you know of? So this is interesting because I really see this as the wave of the future. I really think that in-home spirometry is actually going to become um, a standard in the coming years because of namely what's happening now with this pandemic, because now as PFT labs are starting to open up, I mean, I'm right now physically, I'm in Humber River Hospital doing this presentation and then our PFT lab, I'm just like a few feet from our PFT lab. And um, they've expressed a lot of concerns because they're concerned about, you know, starting to bring in these patients for PFT starting last week. And there's concerns about it's an aerosol generating procedure and the risk of COVID-19. Now, a lot of these patients are already being screened, but I see in-home and Bluetooth spirometry being the next wave of, uh, of telehealth as it pertains to respirology. I don't have much experience with it, so I cannot comment on it, but I think that, um, you know, we are going to be exploring it in the coming months with the current situation as it is. Thank you. So maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask one more or a field one more question. Um, so do you do virtual rounds with the hospital for your patients in the hospital? No, I don't do that uh, right now. Um, <clears throat> see, I, I'm an intensivist. So um, I actually, you know, for critical care. Now, there is a, such a thing as a virtual ICU. And it's more prevalent in the United States. And it's mainly for hospitals that don't have that 24 hour coverage so that they can, you know, camera in on the patients. And, um, and I've done that kind of care when I was in the US. I, I was at a given time, I was looking after 100 patients across four, five, actually, no, six hospitals, okay? With the assistance of at least three or four nurses who were there with me, right? And it wasn't just me. But right now, I don't do, we don't do virtual care in the hospital because we have most ICUs in, in Ontario that I know of have 24 hour coverage as far as I know, because I, I also look them at other hospitals, so I know what's going on in the ICU world. So we don't have the need for that right now. All right, so um, there's, there's a few more questions coming through. Um, so we'll yeah. try to answer them um, after um, this uh, sure. webinar today. Um, so yeah. we'll take those questions and, and provide an answer um, afterwards. Um, and um, if we have time at the end as well, uh, we'll try to answer those questions too after Valerie's presentation. Um, so thank you, Dr. Naeem, for that um, great presentation. Thanks. So we'll just move it along to um, Valerie Filto. Um, she'll be presenting on how they've been um, uh, conducting virtual pulmonary rehab, uh, their virtual pulmonary rehabilitation program at the Lanark, um, Lanark and Renfrew communities. Oh, did I need to share my screen here? Okay, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, so as mentioned, I'm a physiotherapist uh, and I've been working in uh, pulmonary and cardiac rehab for quite some time. And uh, just a little bit about who we are. Uh, so we're a community-based uh, program um, and uh, we're, uh, providing uh, assessment, education, and uh, rehab to uh, COPD and asthma patients uh, in the community. Uh, our staff is mostly respiratory therapists. Uh, I'm the only physiotherapist, and of course we have uh, the chance of having uh, admin support. Um, so we were also providing spirometry testing to help in uh, diagnosis and treatment um, uh, progression. Uh, which is, has been on hold since uh, early March. Um, and of course, uh, all the other um, education provided, it was either one-on-one, -on -one, uh, but a lot of group stuff that was also taking place that has been on hold uh, since the pandemic. Um, so initially we were 
told that our programs would be on hold for about three weeks. Um, so we were just kind of keeping in touch with our active clients, telling them, uh, you know, hang tight, uh, we're going to get back to business as usual in about three weeks time. Uh, that came pretty um, evident that this wasn't going to happen. Uh, lucky for us, we already had created a Facebook page. Um, so we started to become much more active with that um, model to reach out to our patients uh, at home. Um, so we were able to develop some little videos, uh, inhaler techniques, and then uh, so right at the end of March, that's when I started to um, create these uh, very uh, basic exercise routines uh, that we put on our Facebook page three times a week for our patients to have access to something while they're at home. Um, and uh, so, of course, with that, there was a bit of concern with uh, liability. What if people get hurt? What if they have symptoms at home? Uh, so I, I was in touch with my college uh, to ensure that this was something that was, um, you know, sure or safe to do for uh, people. So we added a little bit of a disclaimer uh, to make sure that people know uh, what to do in case of um, symptoms or um, acute, acute emergencies and so on. But what could we do to better support our client? Um, so that's when we started to think, well, we need to be able to reach out to them, not just them reach out to us through our Facebook page. Uh, from the beginning, we were encouraged to make use of the uh, OTN platform. Um, and uh, we've been trying to use that because it's, it's a free platform. We all had our, our own access um, personally to create our own appointments. We have encountered some issues that I think were, are quite common to a lot of people. Um, the unable to connect or uh, freezing uh, after just a few minutes uh, interacting with a client. Uh, some of our staff, even um, if they're using OTN in their house, nobody else in their house can use internet. So it can be an issue for those that have multiple people working from home or students working at home as well. Uh, we've been uh, using Zoom mostly. And as uh, uh, mentioned in the previous presentation, uh, we have a Zoom license that complies with the PHIPAA standards. Uh, so uh, it's uh, safe to use uh, in regards to privacy. Um, and, and I put FaceTime up there because it's been kind of mentioned as uh, maybe it would be an easier way to uh, connect with our clients. Uh, but again, it can be limited to what type of device they're having at home. So it's not quite accessible to everyone. And plus um, some of our staff uh, don't have it at home as well, so you can't use that uh, consistently. Uh, in terms of ease of use for the platform, um, I, I, I find OTN and Zoom are fairly similar in terms of use for most of our people. If they're using a computer, uh, it can be sometimes easier if they know how to manage the computer. If they're using a device like a tablet or a smartphone, they both need to download an app in order to uh, access the, the platform. Uh, and um, of course, connectivity issues can also be uh, a bit of a concern uh, for our clients as they are in a rural community mostly. Uh, and uh, of course, for our small program, cost can be an issue depending on the platform that you're using. Uh, as mentioned, OTN is free to use. Zoom has a cost associated with it. And uh, we only have one account for the whole team. Okay, so just touching briefly on privacy and consent. Uh, we um, have been uh, ensuring that our clients understand what the risks are in terms of using virtual or email communication. Uh, we obtain verbal consent from them that they are uh, okay with it. And we document that in their uh, electronic chart. Um, uh, what was I gonna say? It's still a gray area whether or not that is going to be considered enough. Uh, we do have an actual uh, paper consent form that we used to have our patients read through and sign and then that would be scanned into their chart. 
I can send that through email, they can read through it, but not a lot of them are able to print it out and sign it officially and, and scan it back to me. So I'm not sure if we'll have to retroactively go through all of those patients uh, once we go back to normal, whatever that is, and make sure that that consent is signed. Uh, some of the challenges for our clients have been uh, the use uh, or the availability of technology. So they need some kind of device uh, that has access to a camera uh, and audio uh, as well. So a lot of them, uh, as mentioned before, have a smartphone. Um, that can work just fine. Uh, ideally, they would, it would be better if they had something that could hold the phone for them because it can be a bit long to try and hold the phone in front of them uh, for the, the time that we're interacting with them. Uh, again, internet connection can be uh, iffy at times in the, in the rural community. Uh, are they familiar with downloading apps? Um, uh, you know, I've spent many hours on people's uh, on phone with some of our clients to navigate them to help them figure out how to access the, the Zoom meeting um, for the, the upcoming appointments. Um, and also to keep in mind, uh, do they have access to maybe a private area in their home? Are they comfortable talking about uh, their issues uh, with others uh, around them in their home? So it's something that we, we uh, need to uh, ensure as well. Uh, similar to our client, most of our staff also live in the rural community, so sometimes the internet is not always uh, cooperating for uh, what we need to do. Um, we've been spending a lot more time interacting with our clients in terms of, um, you know, getting their consent for virtual uh, appointments, uh, setting them up with the, the, the tools to be able to access those virtual appointments. Um, and uh, it seems like it's taking away maybe sometimes uh, from the time we would actually do clinical work with them, uh, but it's kind of a necessary um, thing to do in order to be able to give them access to that information. Um, and of course, uh, the Zoom appointment, the way I created them, Unfortunately, they don't get reminders. Um, so uh, sometimes people do forget and then we have to kind of follow up with them um, to, uh, to see is there a reason they weren't there and, uh, and what we can do to make sure that they can connect uh, next time. And in terms of uh, staff, personal, uh, family, uh, life balance, uh, as mentioned, uh, Sometimes there's more than one person working from home. We have students that also need to do uh, Google Meets with their teachers. So that can uh, make scheduling those appointments uh, for work a little bit challenging because the, the strength of the Wi-Fi signal might be uh, affected as well. Uh, some of the challenges obviously for virtual rehab has been, um, we used to always monitor vitals uh, before, during, uh, that's obviously not uh, accessible. Uh, if uh, clients have their own uh, devices at home, whether it's a home blood pressure machine, uh, oximeter, or even just a Fitbit that keeps track of their heart rate, then we can uh, ask them what the readings are and use that. Uh, we've been focusing a little bit more, well, although we did that uh, in on-site rehab too, uh, using a rating of perceived exertion, the talk test to help them monitor their exercise intensity. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're providing maybe a little bit more education on what is that moderate intensity? What is it that it should feel like so that they are better um, equipped to know how hard they're, they're actually exercising? Because it's hard for them to sometimes realize um, at what intensity they need to be exercising at to improve uh, when they feel short of breath, even a little bit at rest. So they're, they're sometimes scared to push it a little bit. And that's what that, um, that on-site rehab provided for them is that they were uh, feeling a little bit more uh, safe to exercise in that environment than they might uh, otherwise feel at home. 
uh, but unfortunately, virtual rehab is, is again, not accessible to all of our clients because uh, some of them don't have internet, some of them don't have an email address, which is needed to um, create those appointments in the first place. And um, so that's uh, one of the barriers. And for those, we would provide a phone uh, support uh, instead. So right now, when we're getting new referrals for rehab, our clients are getting either a phone or a virtual assessment with me and the uh, respiratory therapist um, separately. Um, we, I rely on the client support uh, report uh, for their functional abilities. They tell me, you know, I ask them how their balance is. I ask them some questions regards to that. So they, I get a sense of what, uh, what they're able to do at home. Um, and uh, I'm using a similar template to what I would use before, uh, but there's no observation unless it's a virtual assessment. Um, and uh, in terms of outcomes for exercise capacity, we can use the uh, Duke Activity uh, Status Index, which is a, a subjective way of them to rate their um, ability to perform a list of different activities. Uh, virtually, uh, I mean, it could be done by phone as well, uh, but it's better if I can see the person. So a sit to stand 30 second can give a good idea of their lower extremity strength and function. Uh, and of course, the Borg dyspnea scale to rate their um, uh, dyspnea. Uh, quality of life, uh, those questionnaires were used prior to uh, our virtual uh, rehab. So the CAT, St. George, um, anxiety and depression uh, scales. And again, if available, uh, client reports on what their vitals are at rest at home. Okay. Sorry about that. So before COVID, we would get the referral to rehab. There would be an on-site assessment by respiratory therapist and physiotherapist. Then clients would be uh, attending on-site exercise and education sessions twice a week for eight weeks. Um, and we would obviously provide uh, ongoing reassessment, progression of their exercise prescription outcomes. The main different ones that were present then that are not now is the six minute walk test and their vitals. And of course, uh, self-management is always a big part of rehab. Um, so it was uh, a big part uh, of on-site programming, uh, but it's uh, definitely a bit bigger part of um, home uh, rehab for them. And so right now uh, we're doing things either virtually or by phone. We're relying more on self-report to assess their fitness and function. Um, and we have then to uh, kind of evaluate, are they able to participate in a virtual group? Um, I have a few people that have issues with their hearing and that makes it quite challenging if they can't hear you, um, uh, you know, on their device because the volume is not always optimal. Um, and that's just one example, or if they're not able to access a technology, then they can't participate. Uh, but if they are eligible to participate, then we have to help them navigate the, the technology world to see uh, if they're able to connect uh, with the various platform that we would be using. And as mentioned previously, uh, we have to emphasize their self-management even more um, because they can't rely on coming twice a week for eight weeks with us to help them develop that habit that is so important to uh, improve their health. Okay, uh, some of the advantage of virtual groups is obviously less repetition of the information that we would um, teach them. We can reach a larger audience at once, so less phone calls to make um, uh, in our day. Uh, it brought back that teamwork aspect that we kind of lost as we all went to work in our own house. Um, and, and during those interactions, when we have uh, both me and a respiratory therapist present, we can address more of the issues that can come up in our conversations. Uh, that way we don't have to say, oh, let me get back to my colleague and then they'll get in touch with you and set up an appointment so that they can address this at a later time. So I think more gets done in a shorter amount of time. 
and it's better uh, care for the patient as well. Um, and and the, the biggest part, I think, of the virt virtual groups is that it's allowing our clients to uh, have that interaction between them. That's really what they take from the on-site rehab is they, they create that friendship and uh, social connection that they lost uh, once the pandemic hit. And a lot of our clients uh, living remotely, uh, but just being um, you know, sick with their uh, various uh, respiratory diseases, they often feel kind of alone at home. So that ha has helped them to uh, see that they're not alone and that, um, you know, they can uh, create that, that rapport with the others, kind of going through similar situation. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, it's great because even though our clients are remote, Location doesn't matter. Uh, some of our people prior would have transportation issues. We'd have to try and see how we could get them to come to us. That's a non-issue. Um, uh, during the winter time, bad weather does not affect any of this. So this is always ongoing um, and cannot be uh, interrupted because of a situation such as that. Uh, of course, reducing the risk of spreading infection to both client and staff. Uh, and uh, because, uh, as mentioned, some of our clients are uh, alone and they might have some symptoms that are uh, worsening, but they're afraid to go to the hospital because of the pandemic. And they can't always get in touch with their doctors. So we're able to help them navigate this and, and advise, you know, have you used your action plan? Uh, what, what would you uh, do normally? And then we can better um, uh, help them to, to act upon uh, those uh, symptoms. Uh, we also have a, an emergency phone line that we've uh, created. And uh, so our clients can uh, contact us uh, Monday to Friday and, and we'll get in touch with them within uh, 24 hours. Um, so that can also help uh, ease some of that uh, fear. So lessons learned so far, um, smaller groups are better because it can get a bit overwhelming to have a whole bunch of people uh, interacting um, with us at one time. So we found that four or five clients uh, seems to be uh, ideal uh, to have good interactions with them. Um, and uh, we can also cover uh, various education topics uh, each, each time. Uh, when I created the appointment in our Zoom uh, platform, I wasn't that familiar with it and I didn't really, I wasn't really thinking, I just created them and, and I thought, oh, require registration that sounds good and so I did that but then I soon learned that uh, people don't register so then I had to go back and and enter their email address myself so that because they thought that the link they got was the link to join the meeting when in fact it was a link to register for the meeting then they got a, a second email to actually join the meeting later on so uh, that's a lesson learned that I will try and not repeat in future uh, if you can plan for at least a couple of staff to be present during the virtual appointment. And again, for that, it, it just helps with that teamwork aspect of rehab, but also, um, you know, sometimes a lot of stuff gets uh, discussed and it's better to uh, re remember what was discussed so we can better chart uh, afterwards. Um, that's one of the drawbacks actually of Zoom is it's hard to um, access your charting at the same time. So you lose your screen. So you don't know uh, what people are looking at when you're going away to the chart. So if you have two staff, then one person can look up in your EMR while the other one is leading uh, the discussion. And also it's helping for uh, following up with those that didn't show up uh, to the appointment uh, because we, have, we usually give them a phone call to see uh, what's happened and, and why they weren't able to join us that week. Uh, so adapting to a virtual world. Uh, definitely bigger emphasis on self-management. Um, since they can't um, rely on 
accessing our services twice a week to get them started in their exercise routine, we're definitely encouraging them to keep a, a log of what activity they're doing at home, keep track of their symptoms so that they have something to report whenever we meet back with them. Uh, and of course, uh, we've kind of reduced our frequency uh, in order to allow more clients to access our services. So instead of the same groups of people coming twice a week for eight weeks, we've created smaller groups and we connect with them uh, every two weeks. Um, but in between, obviously, we're seeing other people. But in the meantime, we ask them to phone us should there be some issues arising in between those sessions. Um, and yeah, so uh, education on um, uh, monitoring their exercise intensity. Uh, RPE used quite a bit, talk test also used quite a bit um, so that they can um, rely on that to know how hard they're exercising at. Okay, uh, I've included some links that maybe we'll go over later on if there's questions asked. So uh, a lot of the tools that I mentioned have uh, those uh, links, so even the, the Duke Activity Status Index, will calculate it right away for you as you're filling in, same with the CAPS. Um, and in terms of client feedback, uh, those that have been able to use technology to take part in our virtual um, group uh, found the experience to be quite positive. They they like that they are able to voice their concerns and get um, you know answers uh, right away and that exchange with the other uh, clients kind of going through a similar situation uh, makes them feel more connected as well um, but one thing that we uh, keep hearing from them is always when can we go back to the gym so even though we're offering them quite a bit of support I feel uh, they still would like the that initial you know uh, support that they were getting in, in the rehab as we knew it um, so I think that's pretty much it for me great thank you Valerie there's a few questions in the question and answer box um, so for the person that asked about um, sharing the disclaimer, um, it's actually in the, in the Lanark and Renfrew Lung Health Program Facebook page and the link is shared by Carolyn in the question and answer box. So you could just look there. Um, Valerie, how many patients would you recommend for a group virtual program that you've been running? So we're trying to keep it at four to five on average. Um, sometimes I think you could probably put more in because they don't tend to all show up um, on a regular basis. But uh, if you're if you if they all come, uh, it, it uses up your time pretty uh, pretty quickly. In terms of the um, exercise routine for this group setting, obviously you can't um, develop um, an individual exercise program. Um, so does everyone um, participate in the same exercise session for the exercise component, uh, regardless of where they're at in terms of their um, abilities? So basically, after I do my uh, assessment, I do provide them with a bit of an exercise uh, prescription based on what they're, they've been doing and what they, they should be able to do. Uh, and then uh, they're given some handouts on um, just some basic strength training exercises that they could do at home. Uh, and also they're uh, encouraged to go look at our uh, Facebook uh, exercise videos where uh, they're mostly um, more of a lower intensity, uh, but I always offer um, tips to kind of bump it up a little bit or to uh, keep it lower if they're having issues. So that's kind of how we're addressing that. Okay, thank you. Um, so somebody just wanted to clarify, is only the education material done in a group, not the exercise? Yeah, that's exactly it. So okay. um, we're finding that uh, I'm, I'm just in my little office, so it wouldn't be as easy for me to lead an exercise class. And then a lot of them are just kind of sitting on their couch at home as well. I don't know how easy it would be for them to hold their phone and do the exercise class at the same time. 
so that's where that more self-management aspect is kicking in. We really hope that they're going for their walks or doing uh, some exercise videos at home and then we address um, you know, how they're doing and in terms of uh, how they're finding the exercise they're doing during those uh, virtual uh, group sessions. Uh, so just a couple more questions. Um, do you have a maintenance group and how are you running this if you are? We used to have a maintenance group. So right now uh, these uh, clients mostly access our Facebook page and we also have created a group for more just the social aspect that this is, was a big part of that maintenance group. So then they can connect uh, once a week and then have a chat and discuss whatever topics that they feel uh, would be relevant to them. Okay. And last question, I'm not sure if you can answer Valerie, is when do you think you will be returning to in-class rehab? <laughs> I have no idea really. Um, uh, I, I'm looking at the retail world and they're limited in terms of square footage by how many people they can have in. And we don't have very large spaces and a lot of our equipment are like right next to one another. So I would be quite limited in terms of how many people I could bring in, uh, including staff. And then, um, then I feel that it would create more of a wait time for everyone else as well, because not everybody could access it. So I, I, I really don't have that answer, unfortunately. Um, and uh, just to wrap up, I just wanted to ask Dr. Could just go back to Dr. Naeem. Um, in terms of um, your services, um, if um, I understand that you're in, you're currently working with the primary care teams in Hearst and Timmins as well as the rural Wellington area. Um, are you accepting referrals um, from other sites looking for respirologies or other remote sites? And if so, um, what will be the referral process? What will it look like? So yes, um, oh, Tracy will probably hate me for saying this, but because she's so busy. But, um, you know, what I've noticed is that actually, you know, okay, so over the last few months, my physical office has actually declined. Like I was going there a certain number of times a month, but not last this month, for example, I've only been there twice. Now, the last time I was in my physical office, I had 10 referrals. Now, even those patients I'm seeing virtually right now, but I just don't know whether uh, what the nature of my practice is going to look like six months from now. And um, at this point, I would say, yes, I am um, looking, because I'm actually um, reassessing my entire practice situation, you know, visit, like actual office versus virtual, um, you know, and ICU. I'm just looking at everything. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm also working on some other projects on the side. So I, um, I, do have, I do have the ability to take on, you know, another family health team, um, potentially more than one, but I don't want to make any promises. What I encourage anyone to do who's interested is I've provided my email, just email me at that email. And then I think Sarah will provide it to the group. And then just, uh, we can get in, you know, contact me. We can get, we can talk over the phone and figure out what your community's needs are and see how I can, if, I, if I'm able to help. So I can't make any promises, but I am open to taking on other uh, family health teams. Just another, just another thing. Um, I was also um, looking after uh, patients from North Simcoe. And for those who don't know where that is, that's the, the Midland Penetanguishene area, which is uh, west of Barry. So what happened is that they lost their coordinator because that person took another job. So they have no long health program. So I've lost that. So I actually have the ability to take on another family health team. Um, so yeah, just contact me and we can talk and see what your numbers are, what your needs are and yeah. Thank you. Um, so um, we'll just wrap up then. So um, the questions that we didn't get to, we'll try to answer it best um, after this call. Um, this will be, this session was recorded, so it'll be available to you afterwards. Uh, we'll, we can send the link out. And um, a few people were asking if the slides can be shared so we can work through that after the call as well. Sure. Okay, thank you everyone for attending today. And uh, um, Dr. Naeem's contact or email is in the chat box. If you just wanna copy it, it's n 
Naeem, so N-N-A-E-E-M at hrh.ca. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you everyone.